open. So, thank you for coming to this expert lecture. This is a number of lectures that the, the Master of Science, Science Family Events is organizing. And it's part also of the MSC uh, we are running now. And this time we call with Professor David Haslam, the, uh, the chairman of NICE and ex president of uh, the British Medical Association and the Royal College of General Practitioners. It is a great honor for the medical school and for us that uh, Professor Haslam is in Cyprus and is here with us. He's a uh, member of the, our faculty, he's teaching in the master on electronic <coughs> medicine. And today, um, He's going to present us a short lecture on the role of clinical guidelines in ensuring high quality care. Uh, in light of the implementation of the new national health system, I think uh, it perfectly suits with, with, with what we want to achieve in our healthcare system a high quality provision of care. But without guidelines, I don't think how simple is that. So, thank you very much again for, for joining us, firstly, as a member of our faculty. David, and thank you for accepting to give the lecture. Sorry. Thank you very much indeed, George. And it's, it's absolutely my, my honour to be here. And thank you for the invitation, not just for tonight, but for being part of the faculty. Because what you're doing here in Cyprus, I think, is really exciting. And I'm really pleased to be involved in it. Uh, I'd really like to make this interactive, because I get bored with my voice, so I'm sure you will. So um, if at any stage you want to say you disagree, or please would I explain that a bit better, or whatever, then I'd be really happy for you to do. Um, the, uh, the, the general practitioners on, on the MSC course have my permission to go to sleep, because they've heard an awful lot of this already. Um, but that's why I'd like it to be interactive, um, because with an audience across medicine, and NICE has a responsibility in the UK across the whole of health and social care. Uh, our responsibility is not just clinical guidelines or determining which drugs can and may or may not be used in the National Health Service. We now, as I'll say in a minute, we, we, we look across the whole of health and social care. It's a really quite extraordinary breadth. Um, so that's what I thought I'd talk about tonight, if I can make this work. No, I've managed to go the wrong direction. Nah. Right. thought I'd, I'd talk about these. What's wrong with wisdom? Why can't we just leave good, experienced doctors? I look at this side of the room. Good, experienced doctors just to get on with it. Um, why do we need guidelines? And then I'll tell you a bit about NICE's guidelines program and indeed the, 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 the way NICE develops guidelines and a few examples of whether it makes a difference or not. And so first off, that, that whole question about what's wrong with, with wisdom. Um, well, the simple fact is I think all of us when we go to medical school, whatever, whatever specialty we go into, our aspiration is to provide quality care. And the real, so I, so I work on that assumption with everyone, that they're not just trying to get through the day. You wouldn't be in this room tonight at this time of the evening if you weren't interested in quality and developing quality and improving quality. Um, and I think all of us qualify as doctors with a remarkable body of knowledge I remember when I was at medical school, they told us that uh, at least 50% of what we learned uh, would turn out to be, to be wrong. Um, the difficulty being that they didn't know which 50%. And of course, it turns out to be much, much more than 50% has turned out to be wrong. Um, because that's the whole point of science. Science is constantly testing, changing, evaluating. Uh, and that, of course, then causes us all the problem, because from that day that you qualified when you knew everything, your knowledge gradually atrophies, and the research evidence gradually builds up. Um, I, I was saying, well, one of the, the other problems on top of this is that medicine used to be relatively safe and pretty ineffective, and now it's remarkably effective and potentially quite hazardous. So again, the requirement to get things right becomes ever more important. Right back at the beginning of my career, there were so many fewer, can you have many fewer? Many fewer drugs and therapies and so on of, than there are now. So the risk of things like interactions and so on was much less. And then there was some remarkable research done from Scandinavia a few years ago in which um, 
they, they came up with this wonderful uh, analysis that if a well-motivated generalist physician read two research papers every evening of the year to try and keep up to date, at the end of 12 months, he or she would be 500 years behind in their reading. The production of papers being so ridiculous um, that we cannot keep up with it. And this was a, a paper in the BMJ in 1998 uh, in which this, this guy is a friend of mine, Arthur Hibble, uh, actually produced all the guidelines relevant to general practice at the time and piled them on his desk. And that was 1998. Just think what it's like now. The, uh, the, the never-ending sort of uh, supply of, of guidelines. Um, so uh, trying to keep up to date is obviously sort of critical. Um, and what I'm talking about with clinical guidelines are these, are these areas. Broad guidance covering all or specific aspects of the management of a particular condition. Um, and really important, and I'm going to say this till I'm blue in the face, recommendations in guidelines are advisory but can be used, and we use them a lot in the UK, to develop quality standards which are then uh, used to measure or to be a metric that allows you to measure the quality of care that's being delivered. So part of the, almost the side effect of the development of guidelines is the development of the metrics. Um, and one of the things we try and focus on in developing those metrics are areas where there's significant variability in practice, where it's absolutely no point in developing a metric for something everybody does well. You only really want to be developing metrics for things where there's problems. And, um, and so, very much as I say here, you try and develop if you're developing a guidelines program, focus on the area where there's inappropriate variations in treatment, where people keep doing ineffective things. Intriguingly, the very first guideline that NICE produced in 1999 was on the management of wisdom teeth, um, which still surprises me. But, but the, the, almost the mythology of who does and doesn't need their wisdom teeth removing um, I would imagine, uh, it'd be quite interesting, but I won't do it. I bet there's a, there's a gradient in this room based around age as to whether you do or don't have your wisdom teeth. Um, because frequently they were just removed for no very good reason. Uh, so um, the need to a a apply established treatments and cost effectiveness. Everyone thinks of NICE as being very much focused on cost effectiveness. When we look at new drug therapies, that's one of our prime roles, but it isn't our prime role uh, across many other areas. For instance, um, last week, NICE produced new guidelines uh, on the management of uh, labor, uh, where people should, should opt to have their children, their babies. And rather to everyone's surprise, the evidence base said that certainly from a second pregnancy onwards, you're probably safer or, safer or as safe at home as you are in hospital. Uh, and this, of course, created a whole bunch of headlines in the UK and people accusing NICE of saying this because it was cheaper. But actually what the analysis of the evidence said was that if you're in hospital, you're more likely to have things done to you because people in hospital do things. Um, whether those things are necessary or not, uh, are there any obstetricians here? Am I treading on really dangerous ground? <laughs> but I noticed you nodding while I was speaking, so I'm very encouraged by that. Um, so re a really interesting sort of topic area. Uh, NICE manages, I, I think I've been chairman now for about um, a year and a half, just over a year and a half. Every now and again we have a day that NICE doesn't feature on the front page of one of our national newspapers. It is quite extraordinary how either controversial or whatever things tend to be. Um, NICE was introduced to address what in the UK we term the postcode lottery, the fact that there was significant variability of, um, uh, of different treatments in different areas, and it was felt that this was just unacceptable. And the bottom one, that Pat Tower of Babel, the, the, the extraordinary difficulty that all of us have to keep up to date. Well, if you can't keep up to date, let someone do it for you. Um, and so the background, NICE was developed in 1999 to reduce variation and to uh, try and address uncertainty and to set national standards for how people with certain conditions should be treated. 
So if I just sort of go through very briefly the history of, of NICE, and particularly in red I've highlighted the guidelines programme. 1999 we started with our technology appraisal work, which is, um, I, I think it's an awful piece of jargon, technology appraisal, but this is the work of looking at new, new drugs to see does the extra cost is, um, is, is the extra cost of a new drug justified by any benefits over existing treatments? And right at the start, we developed the clinical guidelines program. Uh, and then uh, interventional procedures very quickly moved into the whole question of implementation. It's clearly pointless producing world-class guidelines if they just sit on shelves. So trying to explore ways to encourage uh, clinicians to take these on board seemed important. 2005, we took over uh, an organisation called the Health, De Health Development Agency and now responsible for public health guidelines, looking at issues like um, obesity, exercise, smoking, uh, and so on. Um, 2008, the establishment of NICE International, which is a very small part of, part of NICE. Around about eight people work in that uh, part of NICE in around about 60 countries. Quite extraordinary. They're the most hyperactive bunch of people I've ever come across. And the main remit of NICE International is to particularly help low and middle income countries who are facing that dreadful problem of a, an imbalance between resources and demand, which every country faces. There's always more that you can do than you can afford to do. Uh, and we try and help countries develop their own programs, either of guidelines or whatever. And I know NICE International has been working very closely here in Cyprus. Um, then we developed uh, a program looking at new technologies, diagnostics, the introduction of a thing called NHS Evidence, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. Uh, we took over the National Prescribing Centre, which produces all the information on uh, prescribing. And indeed, we have a responsibility now for the British National Formulary, the BNF, uh, which uh, uh, is probably the, the Bible of prescribing in, in the UK. Um, and then, as I say, last year we took over or we were given the task of developing social care guidelines um, and also highly specialised technologies looking at orphan dr drugs for ultra-rare conditions, for instance. So NICE's remit now extends almost from the molecular to the multinational, from drugs for Alzheimer's through to kindness in care homes, uh, the way that people are cared for. And of course, patients have no interest in these boundaries between health, public health, social care. They just want good care. And it's a bit of an artificial construct, I think, that we've developed uh, in, in the health, health world, where we've separated all these bits out. And from next year, from January, uh, all of NICE's products will cease to be labelled as being either health or public health or social care. They'll just be guidelines, uh, which just feels a much more logical way forward. And uh, as I say, if you've got Alzheimer's disease, yes, drugs matter, but so does kindness, so, does, so do all these other issues. So um, with a breadth of work like that, you have to have, I think, a very broad set of principles that you apply to everything. And I think we apply these to absolutely everything we do. And that is, I have a horrible feeling I'm causing real problems by walking around and you're trying to film me, but I shall keep walking around because that's the way I am. Um, looking at the best evidence that's available, uh, which is a problem in social care. There's quite a dearth of guidelines in the social care arena, uh, a, a dearth of evidence, a dearth of research. It's just, it doesn't mean that nothing in social care matters. It matters hugely, but in terms of uh, uh, re really validated research, it's, it's, it's lacking. Expert input, we use experts in everything we do, but equally important to experts are patients and service users. Uh, who become involved in every committee, uh, in every piece of work that, uh, that NICE does. Um, our committees uh, are all independent of NICE, so it, it's all labelled NICE, but they're set up independently. We put everything we do out to consultation, we review it on as rapid a turnover as we possibly can, and try and make everything open and transparent. And for instance, NICE's board meetings, which I chair, are held in, in public, uh, this year we've had meetings in, um, I think, Gloucester, Doncaster, Kendall, Bristol, and somewhere else. Um, 
and we go and hold a meeting either in a hospital or a town hall where up to 90 members of the public will come along and during the course of the board meeting ask questions about NICE's work. It just feels to me extraordinarily important. If we're coming up with decisions <coughs> that are either going to approve or dis disapprove therapies for the public, the public need to be part of that and they need to trust the way we work. Uh, and that feels really important. And then the final one is social values and equity considerations. And what this means is every culture, every country, has a different set of social values. We were talking earlier about, about why isn't there just one world set of guidelines, because the physiology of humans is pretty similar wherever you come from. And on one level, you could, could do that, certainly... Uh, with certain modifications, maybe the management of thyroid disease could be managed in a global guide guideline. But when you're looking at decisions about how to spend money, then the social values of the society you're in become extraordinarily important. And so NICE has this thing called the Citizens' Council, which is uh, a group of 30 members of the public who are recruited by a market research uh, organisation to represent the British public. How 30 people can do this, I have no idea, but I'm assured that by social scientists this is possible. So the, they're, they're, they're matched to the British population by, by age, by sex, by ethnicity, uh, and so on and so on. And then we ask them to consider tricky dilemmas, like how do you balance equity and efficiency? Um, so an example, at the last two-day workshop that they, they had, we gave them as, as an example, you could, this is an example not from healthcare, but an example of how you balance equity and efficiency. You could build a rail, a rail line from Glasgow to London, and it could be non-stop, in which case you'd give a fantastic service to people in Glasgow, but a hopeless service to everyone on the way. Or you could stop lots of times, you give lots of people a not bad service, but a much worse service for the people in Glasgow. Now... That sounds a little bit trite, but it's an interesting debate about how to build a rail line. When you start to apply that to what drugs, what therapies should be available, it becomes really interesting. Do you try and maximise the benefit for the whole population, or do you focus your, your money on the sickest people, in which case you disadvantage a whole group of people? So what what our Citizens' Council does is come up with the social values that apply to our country. And this is one reason I feel really clear. You can't just simply export NICE's products and say this is going to work in your country. Because some countries it'll be fine, other countries it won't. Um, and I think it's really important that countries do have this sort of discussion when they're developing guidelines. Um, so, um, we have a, a Centre for Clinical Practice uh, which is one of the, the directorates in NICE that develops guidelines. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, we develop standards, uh, we develop metrics, and then locally, different parts of the National Health Service use the metrics to determine what the quality of care being delivered in their area is like. Um, and of course, all of this is on top of the fact that doctors want to do the, do the best and they're driven by their own professional training and either they're Royal Colleges, Specialist Societies, or whatever. Um, so, how do you get a good guideline? Well, when in NICE we started looking at guidelines produced uh, across a number of other areas that NICE hadn't looked at, let me go back a bit, there was a need uh, with the health service to develop a whole load of metrics, of quality standards, for huge areas of healthcare, many of which NICE hadn't actually got round to developing guidelines for. So we had to find other guidelines that could be used uh, to produce the metrics. And so we looked at some very well-known, internationally reputed guideline producers and found they were basically developed by uh, a system that I call BOGSAT. BOGSAT for me stands for a bunch of guys sitting at a table. Um, in other words, uh, the, Royal, no, I, the Royal College of Ophthalmologists would hold a uh, discussion meeting one evening and bring together the great and the good and they would sit around a table and they'd decide what good was. 
well, that doesn't work for me. Uh, the, the lack of evidence base there. And it, in fact, it turned out some really well-known guidelines were produced without much evidence. They were produced by, you know, I, all of us can remember consultants back in our youth who said, in my experience, such and such. And they may have been right, but they may have been wrong. And we all know people who spent their entire careers making the same mistakes with ever increasing confidence. Um, and so um, there is an international tool for looking at guidelines called the AGREE tool, the Appraisal of Guidelines Research and Evaluation. And, and NICE adapted this to look at uh, other people's guidelines. And if I, um, so we, we accredit guidelines produced by other organizations now. Uh, which on our website you can see with a sort of little logo saying "nice accredited," uh, and again this um, this felt a really I, I chaired the committee developing guidelines for four or five years, uh, look, accrediting guidelines for four or five years, and we found an awful lot of guideline producers initially failed, then went away, looked at their production methods, and came back to us with a, with revised guidelines, and we think it really has driven up standards. So the sort of thing we look at. Uh, are these, and they, some of them seem so obvious, but, but you absolutely need them to be there. You need to be really clear about the questions your guidelines trying to address. You need to be really <coughs> clear about the population uh, that it applies to. Um, you need to have involved stakeholders at every point. Uh, you need patient and service users. A number of guideline producers we found never talked to patients. Again, it was the, in my experience, this is good. Um, and um, we can talk about the, the impact of, of patients and service users later if you want. Um, there needs to be a really good and rigorous uh, method, methodology involving peer review, being as, as focused as any research paper that's published in any reputable journal. Um, recommendations need to be specific, unambiguous, different options presented, uh, and language and production and so on, really targeted at the people who are going to use it. And we were discussing this afternoon, and I agree with this absolutely, that NICE guidelines are not terribly user-friendly for general practice, where they've got so much to deal with, they're probably more useful for some of the specialties. But hopefully we're going to address this. Uh, and really important that we monitor, because the difficulty with anything that's published is by the time you publish it, more research has come along, and you need to be constantly updating. And independence. If pharmaceutical company A that produces a drug for incontinence develops a beautifully produced guidance on the management of incontinence, and one of its recommendations is should, you should use the drug they make, is that a guideline or is that a bit of marketing? And yet an awful lot of guidelines that people use turn out to actually be very funded by the pharmaceutical industry, and I do not have a downer on the industry, but you need to be absolutely clear where the fundings come from, uh, and be absolutely open and transparent, and recognize when there's bias and so on. And so, um, NICE has these various guidelines centers. Uh, we have a, uh, a cancer center, mental health, uh, internal clinical guidelines, and women's and children's. And these are based in medical royal colleges, so they're based independent of NICE. They recruit independently of NICE. NICE appoints the chairman and supports the methodology, but again, the independence, I think, is really important. Um, and the topics are referred to us by either the Department of Health or NHS England, which is the, now the organizational body responsible for, uh, well, the clue is in the title, the NHS in England. Um, and it's quite a long process from, from the topic being referred to us. And we've actually looked then at all the issues that can come up, develop a methodology, consult, validate. It's around about two years to do this. It's a long time. Um, and I had to face a parliamentary committee a couple of months ago who were very critical of the length of time. They, they wanted us to produce a guideline around the management of sepsis acute sepsis in hospitals, and um, the chair of the uh, parliamentary committee said, you know, if, if, 
if the developers of um, radar in the Second World War had used NICE's methodologies, um, England would have lost, lost the war. I mean, it's the most extraordinary sort of an analogy. He'd obviously been practicing it for a long time. But if you're really going to be using the whole scientific evidence, you absolutely have to go through this, uh, this methodology to make sure you've got things right. And um, I'm going to have a quick slurp of water while you read that. Of course, you can all read. But the top one under the lines do not is just so important. They don't replace clinical judgment. Absolutely critical. And one of the criticisms that, that is occasionally made of guidelines is that it's just cookbook medicine. And it mustn't be cookbook medicine. Um, and so we do, we, we had an interesting workshop, George, uh, about six months ago, on the development, maybe it was longer. July. July, yeah. On, on bringing the, the, the potential for guidelines in, in Cyprus. And there were a few particularly older general practitioners there who just didn't like the idea. They felt it was in the, it was just a bit insulting, a bit getting in the way of their clinical freedom. But it, they were way outweighed by those who felt that this was actually uh, an answer to a problem. But you need, if you're going to really implement things well, you need uh, good organisational support, you need the organisation developing them to be trusted. Um, and so these, these again, are the, uh, what we believe are the benefits. And one of the critical benefits, I think, is, is patience. Um, certainly in the UK, and I suspect in Cyprus, patients see an extraordinary number of people uh, for their healthcare issues. I, was, uh, I heard a lecture a few days ago by a guy who, whose mother had broken her hip and he calculated that over a four-week period, she'd seen 66 different health professionals of one sort or another. Whether it was ambulance crew, general practitioner, first doctor they saw in an accident emergency, an emergency room, consultant, surgeon, nurses on the ward, 66 people. So it's kind of important that 66 people talk to the same script. Otherwise, and again, I'm sure you all recognize the issue of Patients asking advice from the physiotherapist who says, well, you must get up and walk, to the nurse who says, for heaven's sake, what are you walking for? To, you know, so, etc., etc. So again, developing guidelines, and again, for us, the fact that these hopefully will gradually extend into social care, so when people, particularly the elderly, are discharged into social care homes, the sort of advice they get is consistent across the board. Um, that becomes extraordinarily helpful. Um, and if you want to get a new guideline program running, you need all these. You obviously need leadership, you need support, you need to have worked out the finance and so on and so on. This, that's all pretty self-evident for any bit of change management. So, um, does it make a difference? Uh, just a few, few slides. This was uh, a nice um, guideline uh, 92 that we produced on the uh, advising that everyone admitted to hospital should be assessed for VTE risk and uh, in the uh, two years post-publication the number of patients being assessed certainly in one study went up to 98.6 percent. Now interestingly this was also driven by the fact that some money was attached to this, that trusts were funded extra funding if they made sure that they hit the right targets for assessing VTE risk and part of that was driven by the government, uh, the Department of Health Around about, the, the calculation was around about 25,000 people were dying each year from pulmonary emboli, uh, either in hospital or when they went home again. So uh, assessing for VTE risk is extraordinarily important. This was an anaesthetic one, um, uh, recommendation in the NICE guideline that temperature should be checked. I'm no anaesthetist, none of this makes any sense to me at all, but apparently it matters uh, that you should have your temperature checked on induction and after every 30 minutes. And again, dramatic changes, and that wasn't uh, provided with money. So we find that people do listen to what we say. Um, I won't do any more. So what are the problems? Well, the first one, particularly for GPs, is, is it's just overwhelming. There's so many guidelines. How on earth do you keep up to date with those? Uh, that is um, 
for nice products over the last 15 years. Uh, so in 2013 to 14, we produced just over 250 different guidelines on one thing or another. Um, and I completely accept that no sane human being can keep on top of all those. So you need to work out in any team who's going to keep an eye on what's going to be relevant. The different colour things relate to the different types of guidelines. Um, we've tried to produce our guidelines in as, as, as user-friendly a way. We've developed a thing called Nice Pathways, where, for instance, all the guidelines on hypertension are linked in a sim simple algorithm. And where there's a coloured block, you can click on it. For instance, diagnose and, and management uh, and assessment of hypertension. You click on that, you get uh, more of an algorithm. Um, and click on any of these, you'll get more details. So everything on the NICE website now laid out in this methodology to just to try and make it a bit more accessible to people. Um, we have this thing called NICE Evidence Search, which I commend to you all. This is like a Google search engine, which sorts and sifts and prioritizes uh, evidence, uh, health information on the basis of the quality of the evidence, rather than on the basis of how much the users have paid to, you, to Google. Um, and uh, we find this is used massively internationally. I think around about 25% of the hits on this website come from the USA, which is fascinating. Um, and then the other big problem, which I, I can bore for England and any other country on, is multimorbidity. Uh, this remarkable, fabulous success. I'm always struck by the fact that the aging population is talked of as being a problem. When you get to my age, it feels wonderful. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and the simple fact is that people are surviving in a way that they never did, but as they survive, healthcare, if you take, healthcare I think went through a number of phases. There was the phase maybe 50 years of infectious disease, and then 50 years of acute disease. Much of my early career, certainly as a hospital doctor in the beginning of my career, was things like perforated ulcers, heart attacks, whatever, that you were sick, you, you were well, you became sick, you went to the hospital, you got better, you went home, that was the end of it. Now we're into a completely different era where you don't die. You know, you either, those conditions, you either died or you didn't. Now you don't die, you survive, and you collect more conditions on your way. So here, this, this graph uh, looks at multimorbidity. This is in Scotland. But the, so the, the, um, we've got age group along the bottom and the number of conditions, so the blue box over the left side is people with no long-term conditions. So children, most of them have no long-term conditions. But you see, as age goes by, you collect more and more long-term conditions. Uh, by the age of 65, 65% of the population have two or more long-term conditions. Uh, most over 75s have three or more long-term conditions. There are more people in the UK with two or more long-term conditions than there are with one long-term condition. In other words, single long-term conditions are unusual. So how do we organise healthcare? By single long-term conditions. So we have cardiology departments, respiratory medicine departments, neurology departments. How do we organise research? Well, we exclude people with comorbidities and multimorbidities. We exclude the over 65s. So we've actually managed to create healthcare systems, certainly, certainly in the UK, which are almost perfectly designed for the wrong population. Um, I was part of the um, the Royal College of Physicians uh, had a thing called the Future Hospital Commission over the last uh, couple of years looking at how hospitals should be developed in the future. And the one great conclusion was a real, real need for more generalists. Uh, that, that the increasing specialisation has become a problem. And it's a really difficult thing to try and address because um, most young doctors see higher the level of specialisation they can get into as being a mark of prestige and esteem and advancement. And indeed being a generalist is a sort of thing you go through on the way to becoming a specialist. <coughs> but actually, if you, the more you think about this, the less logical it is that we've somehow created a situation where the smaller your area of expertise, the higher your prestige, and the broader your area of expertise, the lower your prestige. So I was talking to a group of medical students in Cambridge not long ago who talked about a consultant saying to them, you'd better buck your ideas up or you'll risk ending up as a GP. And I would say the exact opposite. 
you know, you better buck your ideas up or you'll risk ending up as a vascular surgeon. I mean, you know, which sound, the thing is, whenever I say that, people laugh, and you realize by the laughter, the extraordinary, because if you flip it, it's not funny. And it absolutely gives, gives the, 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 the game away. Um, so how the, the, the world of physicians is going to develop more generalists, how every country is going to need more generalists. If you take a patient like a patient of mine I know well um, with uh, coronary artery disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, um, macular degeneration, uh, osteoarthritis and depression, well which specialist does he go to? And you've got some interesting challenges coming up in Cyprus related to that question. So the key for me, the key to all this is patient centeredness just focusing everything on the patient in front of you, not treating the guideline as an instruction. Guidelines should be used unless there's a good reason not to, and a good reason not to can include patient autonomy and it can include multimorbidity. It does not include, I don't believe in your ready guidelines, or my experience tells me. That won't wash with me. What will wash is patients who say that they, they want something different from I go, part of my job is to go and meet the president of all the medical royal colleges in the UK and they all tell me they're worried sick about junior doctors who just treat nice guidelines as instructions rather than as the best evidence to help them work with their patients to, to find out what's best with patients. So I use this phrase over and over, over again. I have no idea if there are any trams in Cyprus. I suspect not, but hey, you know what I mean. Um, but it, it does feel really critically important. So I think that's probably all I wanted to say. I'd be really interested in your comments, what you see the options for Cyprus are in this. The whole generalist specialist debate, which I think is an incredibly complex one. The role of information technology in bringing this sort of stuff into the consulting room, whether in primary or secondary care. Um, how on earth do we possibly keep on top of all this stuff? I'm a little bit. Thank you.